Welcome to Learning with Leaders today. My guest is Björn Jakisch. He is working at Henkel in Asia currently, and he will be talking about the importance of the group diversity independently of, you know, gender, geography, personality, etc. Uh, he also is um, sharing his idea of a two-way coaching and how to remain approachable to the coachee as well and how much he learns also from a coachee and he will be talking about calculated risk taking have fun enjoy bye bye good morning Björn welcome to today's session learning with leaders how are you doing good morning Paco very very happy to be here have been really looking forward to this session thanks for having me yeah I mean um, it's a pleasure and <clears throat> I know that uh, we we'll discuss uh, quite some topics which are very close to your heart. But, but before doing this, um, would you mind sharing a little bit uh, regarding your personal background? Sure, thank you. Yeah, my name is Björn Jakisch. Uh, I'm currently based out of Singapore. Um, I have more than 20 years of professional experience in the chemical industry, more precisely in the specialty chemicals industry under my belt. I have worked for globally leading players like Honeywell and since more than six years I'm now working with Henkel. Throughout my career I was fortunate enough to learn and work across many different business disciplines including innovation, sales, marketing, strategy, business development and lately operation supply chain. And uh, for more than half of my career I have been running large global and regional P&Ls with direct exposure to the US, Europe and Asia Pacific. My background, I'm a biochemist with a master in PH, master and PhD in, in that same discipline and also went back to school for four years after four years into my professional career to earn my MBA from INSEAD. INSEAD is close to Fontainebleau, I think, huh? Correct, yes. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah, so I mean, learning is an extremely important topic in, in your Vita and uh, lifelong learning is, is uh, very important for you. So um, what would you recommend young professionals uh, from the beginning of their careers when they probably also just have finished uh, university? Um, it might be a little bit counterintuitive. Why should they get advice to continue lifelong learning, right? Yeah, no, very, very good question. And uh, I think very, very relevant um, to start a journey. Um, so maybe let me answer the question by reflecting a bit on my on my own journey. So when I um, started my professional career, or I mean, even later when I progressed in my journey and changed to new roles, um, I always benefited um, from the foundation that I'd already built, so formal, informal learning um, um, on the prior positions and especially from a mindset to perform and grow. So every time I assumed a new responsibility, obviously, I mean, like everybody, I was drinking water from a fire hose and I had to learn a lot really. So as I became more familiar with my new responsibilities over time, I could leverage my learnings and convert them into routines. So over time, the learning curve flattened a bit. Now, there's a risk, of course, then to become complacent and to assume, well, I, 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 I got it, I understand it. But instead, I think it is important to use the time that one frees up to create, well, a deeper and broader experience into other aspects of the job. So um, learn these areas in these areas and convert these learnings into another set of routines. So creating time and space for additional le learnings. So I think you get the gist of it. It's learn, convert, repeat. And to keep this virtuous cycle running, it's really critical to stay curious and, and open-minded, in my opinion. So it's about staying humble and hungry. Ask as many questions as possible. Never fall for the notion that you have it all covered and um, that things will be easy from here onwards. And always reinvest the time you free up to learn more. So mm. personally, I have applied this approach to both my the technical elements of my job and but also to others uh, of my professional journey such as learning about office dynamics stakeholder management and so on same logic applies so staying open-minded and humble very important and the underlying mindset is of course you want to learn and uh, over time i could transform this this approach to a habit 
So by now, by today, it becomes, it's really natural to me. Um, and I'm still very much following the same approach after more than 20 years in the industry. And I dare to stay, to stay it still works. Interesting. So now you are uh, working <clears throat> since a few years in an extremely dynamic uh, geographical area, Asia Pacific. Yes. Um, so you uh, are responsible for, I think it's around 4,000 people. Um, VUCA is uh, omnipresent. Uh, it's even probably increasing every year. Um, so how do you successfully balance uh, this dynamic with your learning requirements? How do you do that? Yeah, so I mean, I think the first step, as I, as I just um, also elaborated, the first step is to accept that learning is not optional and that it is a lifelong matter. So I firmly believe that becoming sloppy or complacent in that area will come back to bite you rather sooner than later. Mm -hmm. So for me, staying on top of lifelong learning, learning is both a mindset and a discipline topic. So we touched on the mindset piece a little bit for the discipline part. It's about generating the time really to learn and absorb. This needs to be a very conscious choice. It's very easy to get directly into the operational day-to-day -day stuff and to lose sight of your own learning journey. So, and this of course eventually leads into a discussion about personal productivity and how to focus on the essentials and so on. So this would be a whole series um, of sessions that we could could uh, record without fully covering the topic, of course. But um, besides the learn, convert and repeat cycle that I uh, mentioned earlier, what I also do is I consciously set time aside to absorb and reflect. So what I do is I regularly put so-called X days into my calendar. So I literally, well, in, in times of uh, electronic calendars, it's, it's not a cross out anymore, but I literally block out, I cross out um, the day and reserve the day to reflect um, on how to progress the topics at hand. And also, um, there's a very, very strong set of tools or a set of uh, sources available, and that's uh, basically books and articles. I'm, I'm a strong believer of, of reading as much as possible. I, I really consider articles, books, and also other media as distilled knowledge, so others have sort things through for you already. So this gives me or gives gives anybody, um, anyone an advantage to absorb much faster. And that of course tailors to the need to balance workload and learning requirements with time. Talking about uh, teams and <clears throat> diversity, which is also a topic uh, which is uh, extremely important uh, nowadays. Um, I mean, I've understood that, I mean, studying, learning, uh, book smartness is pretty high on your agenda. What about uh, street smartness and what about the balance of both aspects in your teams? Yeah, no, very valid question also. I mean, book smartness, as I just um, uh, explained, it's about reserving the time, it's about making it happen. But it comes back to what are your sources um, to learn. So. The street smartness, of course, comes from the interaction with other people to listen um, and to learn, to accept that they are experts in a field that you are not an expert in. So very consciously and openly listen with the world to learn. Um, also on the street smartness dimension, I think it's the right way to go. So um, talking about interacting with other people, getting inspired by other people, um, would you mind sharing your most memorable or one of your most memorable personal coaching experiences early in your career? Yeah, very happy to. And I mean, there's one that really stands out. And uh, well, for me, it was the, the single biggest aha moment in my mm, whole career, I would say. And that was about seeing the power of diverse teams unleash. So a bit of context, um, I started my MBA and for the first two modules, the business school, uh, school had preset working groups of five students. So I was in a group with two ladies and two other gentlemen, all from different countries, different regions with backgrounds in programming, economics, electrical engineering, commodity purchasing and chemistry in my, in my case. So we soon realized that our 
different cultural and professional backgrounds and experiences combined with our different personalities and approaches to topics created a super powerful combination to get our MBA group studies done. Really an aha moment and ever since then I've been a very strong advocate of, of team diversity and leveraging diverse teams to superior outcomes. You mentioned that they were different to you in two, two main aspects. So from their study background and speciality, and they were also from different geographical re uh, regions. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky question probably, but if you had to decide what contributed more to this team diversity, whether it was the different cultural and geographical background or the study background, if you had to decide, which one would you take? Nah, it's really a trick, trick question, Paco. But um, let, let me let me um, give a bit of an evasive answer here. I think it was the full package. So we had gender diversity, we had cultural diversity, we had personality diversity, we had background diversity. I think this package really made it. And uh, when I'm building teams, I pay a lot of attention to get as much diversity as possible uh, into the teams. And mm. this diversity can come from all kinds of different dimensions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I understand. So uh, looking then at your own, let's say, um, coaching approach with your team, um, I mean, we, uh, we both know that there is a, a lot um, of influence uh, regarding also the, the trust level uh, amongst the team and so from your team towards you and vice versa. So how does that work? Uh, do they actively seek your support? Uh, how do you approach the coaching in your team? Yeah, no, very relevant question also. So for me, first of all, coaching is a two-way approach. So as much as I am offering my perspective to younger or more senior men members of my team, I really also enjoy learning from them and growing on the matters that they are engaged with and that they are experts in. So overall, coaching very much relies on trust from my perspective. So how do you build trust? I mean, having frequent and meaningful interactions clearly aids the, the case here. And uh, well, in today's setup, it's a bit more challenging. It's obviously easier to have these interactions face to face, but I think they also still work in a in the virtual setup that we are forced to work sometimes under today. So with some adapted rules, but I think it's a barrier that can be well overcome. So then this comes goes hand in hand with a topic of, of approachability. Um, in a in a face to face in a physical setup, very simple things like open door policy go a long way. Um, and of course, interacting with the same level of respect and integrity across all levels of the organization is also key in that context. Maybe more on the virtual setup, um, freeing up time, setting informal um, time aside, um, setting um, your, your team status or your video conference status on available. All these things decrease the barriers and um, help to create an open atmosphere and eventually trust. Now, these are, I would say, more mechanical, easy uh, ones, but in my opinion, I think the single biggest challenge for good coaching is true listening. What I have observed um, is that most people listen to respond and not to understand. Mm -hmm. This creates a major dilemma because obviously, I mean, coaching is most effective when the coachee feels well understood. So. Engaging in an open and honest dialogue with the coachee with the sole intent to understand is key from my perspective. So a coachee walking out of such a dialogue with the feeling that I have really listened to her is the biggest encouragement for her, in my opinion, and will make her come back um, continue the dialogue on this topic or um, other topics. So yeah, really um, making sure that um, you are in listening and understanding mode is key for a good coaching relationship. Mm. Yeah, I have so many follow up questions on, on that topic. Um, <laughs> probably an easy one. Let's imagine you have crossed out a part of a day for your learning topic. And right. then because of your open door policy, a coachee seeks advice. What do you do? 
Well, it's it's a it's a topic of um, priorities in this case. I mean, people first, no doubt about this one. And um, I think in a trusted and trustful environment, it's easy to say, hey, I hear you. I'm ready for you in 30 minutes. Let me just wrap up this thing. I get back to you. And um, I encourage my team members to always come to me, um, even if the door is closed, to knock. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that I say, well, no, not right now, and I come back later. And that works. Fine. So another topic which um, spontaneously comes into my mind is um, to encourage, you know, calculated risk decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, we we all talk or we are used to talk. Yes, of course, you know, I allow my teams to take calculated risk decisions. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that a coachee comes to you and um, this coachee has something very specific in mind. It probably doesn't align with your personal opinion, but how do you react when what the coachee has in mind is worth a try, although it's not aligned with what you would do? Well, I just had a recent um, example on, on this one. So um, one of my team members came to me and asked for a you know, certain investment on a, on a certain on a certain asset. And I said, well, why would we do that? Um, because the, the circumstances were such that it didn't resonate with me. So it, it didn't it didn't appear to make sense to me. So coming back to listening mode, I was I caught myself being in the answering mode. I said, well, it doesn't make sense. But taking the step back and saying, well, let's go through this. Let's make sure you and I understand that. My team member basically convinced me and basically uh, called me by my my own uh, by my own propaganda um, that this was the right decision. So he had thought it through very well and uh, basically ticked all the boxes that I would normally tick when coming to a decision. So again, I caught myself in not being in listening mode and understanding mm -hmm. mode, and um, I think that cured it. So listening does help. Interesting. So we already um, mentioned a few times, you're now working since a few years out of Asia Pacific. Um, I mean, I've been there uh, quite a few times, but I honestly, I don't claim to, to know it uh, and to know the people very well. So I'm wondering uh, if you could share from your perspective, what are the main differences uh, between, let's say, hmm, Asia Pacific or Singapore uh, towards Europe or more Western style cultures? Yeah, no, also super interesting question that could probably fill, you know, numerous sessions also. For sure. But, um, let me try to answer um, that question without falling into stereotypes. What I indeed perceive is a, a higher speed and dynamic in Asia Pacific compared um, to Europe. Um, in general, I witness a stronger drive to grow personally. So people want to grow personally, professionally, economically. Um, and also that's combined with a higher degree of flexibility and to try out new things in Asia. I think that's the underlying driver of the perceived higher speed and dynamic. Um, what also contributes, in my opinion, is that um, the region appears to be further advanced in its digital journey. So people appear to be more willing to trade data for convenience and personal growth. And of course, this is an enabler for business models and opportunities, and especially more speedy business models and opportunity. So um, these factors, well, they do drive a, a different business culture. So at face value, the way of doing business appears to be much more, much faster and much more competitive than in Europe. And looking one level deeper and then peeling back the onion uh, by a couple of layers, in my opinion, this still holds true. And the underlying motivation is the dynamic growth mindset um, that I feel we have lost to a, to a degree in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, you probably noticed as well, I mean, you're still coming back frequently to, to, to Germany, um, that the younger generation uh, is also very keen to find the right work-life balance some people call it work-life integration. Um, mm -hmm. 
so what's your view on how the Asian or Chinese or Singaporean young people perceive that? Mm -hmm. No, also also a super relevant question. Um, the I think to give a bit of, of, of flavor and a bit of um, context here, um, the region is very much on um, on a digital journey, and um, the young generation here basically lives both in a in a digital and in a physical world. Um, that combines with um, the, the relevant ecosystem. I mean, if you look at, at China, for example, if you look at, at tools like WeChat, there's a seamless integration between work and life. Um, why are these tools also? So I think um, the convergence is, in my opinion, stronger here in Asia Pacific. Of course, there are regional exceptions. I don't want to want to generalize too much, but um, I think overall there is a, a bigger convergence. Um, on the other hand, if I if I see my sons um, behaving, they're still in school age, how they behave um, in the digital versus physical space, I think that convergence is all convergence is also happening more and more in the Western world. Mm. Um, so let's now try to um, match two extremely important topics uh, in our conversation: learning and uh, also, let's say, yeah, the the um, the digital um, approach um, within uh, the region you are you are working. So, mm -hmm. what are your observations regarding how young professionals learn in Asia Pacific? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me let me maybe give a bit of uh, of context here. Um, so, what I see is that um, the today's generation of young professionals here in Asia Pacific basically have, have leapfrogged a step in their digital journey. So in Europe, North America, um, the digital journey over the maybe last 30 years or so went from desktops to laptops and then to mobile devices. In Asia Pacific, the population basically went straight to mobile devices and the respective or the relevant digital ecosystem. I mean, we are clearly on a, a mobile um, first culture here in Asia. So, and this, I mean, I, I mentioned that earlier, this cre created um, convergence on, on, the one hand, on the one hand um, of the face-to-face um, -face or the physical uh, space and the digital space. But on the other hand, it also created a, well, certain convenience and expectation when it comes to assessing, uh, accessing information. So to reach your tar target audience, now coming to the learning aspect, um, whether it's well, for learning or whether it's for marketing purposes, um, one needs to decrease the barrier to receive this information, to make this information accessible for the target audience. Mm -hmm. So in a mobile first context, obviously, I mean, delivery of, of trainings, of any other information needs to happen via mobile devices and the relevant app infrastructure you mentioned WeChat and I think that's that's a very relevant tool in this context and then look at the the digital ecosystem as uh, I look at the digital ecosystem as a information infinity pool I mean there's infinite information in there so the next challenge is to attract the attention of the um, of your target audience so for learning purposes what I have found is that gamification um, clearly helps Mm. And because it helps to well, combine convenience, so um, having the um, information accessible in the respective ecosystem um, on the respective devices um, with instant rewards um, that basically helps to, to reach your learning goals. And the icing on the cake, in my opinion, is adding a bit of a competitive um, uh, element here. Asia um, has a pretty competitive culture. So, yeah, that really helps to, to propel the learning in a gamification context. Yeah, what I'm hearing is matches a lot with uh, our own uh, strategy. We're investing a lot into um, micro and what we call nano learning bits and pieces. Um, so, um, 
Uh, thank you very much for for your um, perspective here. So let's um, round up this uh, conversation again with learning, but now into a different context. So um, how does uh, in job application or in interviews, um, what what's the, the importance of the learning topic and the learning approach you see in those young professionals? What importance does it have for you? Well, this is one of the, the key elements um, that I'm looking for in each and every job interview I'm conducting. So intellectual curiosity and the commitment to lifelong learning this are really the two factors that I'm regularly reviewing in job interviews. And um, there are a lot of statements made around those two, two elements, but I will really be working with the candidate in an interview to find supporting evidence. And the presence or the absence of supporting evidence can be a big needle mover of the, to the outcome of the interview. So I mean, basically coming back full circle to the start of our discussion, um, experiences and past learnings have brought the candidate into the interview process. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to secure the next job and to be able to grow further, the willingness and the ability to learn are the future success factors. And that's really what I'm looking for in job interviews. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Björn, I mean, we're almost at the end of our conversation. Um, is there anything at the end you would like to add, anything which comes into, into your mind regarding, you know, diversity, learning, uh, Asia Pacific, anything you would like to add? No, I mean, on, on the learning journey, I think uh, there, there is a lot of, of buzz around it. Um, but I would really like to encourage everyone to stay hungry, to stay humble. And learning has never been easier. I mean, there are so many um, sources available. There is such a great e ecosystem where you can easily learn. Let's make use of it. Excellent. Björn, thank you very much again for this very insightful and interesting uh, conversation. I wish you all the best uh, for the future and for your kids as well, of course. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much, Paco. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.